Go on, class. Okay, so we're going to talk about the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. So again, a charged particle moving in a magnetic field, typically there's going to be a force on it, which will cause an acceleration. And so we want to talk about the motion. Now, one thing that's very important, um, when we're talking about, you know, we're, we're forced to deal with three dimensions when we're dealing with magnetic fields, because, you know, we have a velocity in one direction, a magnetic field in another, force is perpendicular. And so very often it's convenient to draw the magnetic field as the one that's perpendicular to the board. And so we can do this, I'm going to write this on the right. I'll just write it small. All right, so I'm going to finish this picture. Okay, so we want to represent the magnetic field as the one that's perpendicular to the board. So the magnetic field is either into the board or out of the board. And so we can represent that region where the magnetic field exists using dots or X's. Where uh, if the magnetic field is coming out of the board, we'd use dots. If the magnetic field is going into the board, we use X's. And a good way to remember that is to think of an arrow, like uh, an actual arrow fired out of a bolt. So picture an arrow coming towards you. So if it's coming towards you, it's coming out of the board towards you. You see the arrow head, which is a dot. Where if the magnetic field's going into the board, picture it like moving away from you. And you see like the feathers on the back that form that, you know, they have feathers and... I don't know, I don't have much experience with arrows, but uh, imagine they have... I don't even know if they have two sets of feathers. Maybe just one's enough to stabilize it, but whatever. Uh, just a way to memorize which is which. So let's say that we have a magnetic field going into the board. So it's into the board. There are X's here. And we have a charged particle... I'm going to consider this a positive charge that's going to enter this region with a magnetic field. And let's look at right when it enters this region. So it's moving in this direction, and the magnetic field is into the board. So, again, put your fingers in the direction of velocity, curl towards the magnetic field. The magnetic force is upwards. And that's going to cause the particle to move upwards. However, once it starts moving upwards, you know, it has momentum in the x direction. So it's going to do this. It's going to curl upwards. It's going to go on some curved path. And now its velocity is in this direction. And remember, the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the velocity. So again, v cross b. Now the magnetic force is in this direction. And so the direction of the velocity and the magnetic force are constantly changing. They're always perpendicular to each other. And so there's two uh, very important, uh, well, those are two very important facts. So one is that the velocity and force The force is always perpendicular to the velocity. So that's one thing. And um, the result of that, let's calculate the work done by the magnetic force. And remember, uh, just from basic definition of work, if the force is perpendicular to the direction, the displacement, 
The work done by that force is zero. And so we have this result that the work done by magnetic fields is always zero. Magnetic fields don't ever do work. Which is a, sounds like a very strange result. You can picture, say you have a magnet, uh, or you can even picture like the crane that holds that big electromagnet above a car, and then it lifts up the car. Obviously, there's work being done on the car, and it is kind of being done by the magnet, but it is not being done by the magnetic field itself. Magnetic fields do no work. So, uh, remember back in mechanics, you have the work energy theorem. So, the net work done on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So let's say there are no other forces acting on this object. It's just moving. I mean, gravity is probably present, but we're dealing with small charged particles that are moving very quickly, where gravity is insignificant. And so let's just say the magnetic force is the only force that is acting on this particle. If no work is being done on this, that means it's moving at a constant speed. The kinetic energy is not changing, and so the particle moves in a constant speed, and the force is always perpendicular to that uh, direction of motion. And so what these two facts together tell you is that this particle is going to undergo um, uniform circular motion. So constant speed, force is always perpendicular, that gives you circular motion. Uniform because it's at a constant speed. And so we can say the magnitude of the acceleration in this case, if you remember back from uh, mechanics, an object in uniform circular motion has an acceleration v squared over r. All right, so, uh, yeah, if, if the only force acting on the object is magnetic, or at least the only significant force, we can say it goes through uniform circular motion. And I'll look at an example of that. That's, uh, there's a very important application of this. And... Say we have a region with a magnetic field here, and say we create a beam of particles. So I want the magnetic field to come out of the board in this case. So like right when it enters, you know, let's say these are positive charges. So V curl B, that points to the left. And so it's going to do this. It's going to go in some arc like this. Circular arc with a radius R. But let's back up a little bit. Let's say we have a container filled with a gas, and we ionize that gas. So, and we create a little hole here, so the ionized particles can come out. Now, we know they're moving fairly quickly, but what we're going to do is we're going to accelerate them. So let's say we have a capacitor here. That's going to create a, an electric field. And we put a hole in the plate. And these are positive ions that are coming out of here. So we've got these positive ions that are kind of moving around, bouncing off walls and stuff. And occasionally one's going to come out. And that's be going, you know, kind of in a straight, the straight line here in order to uh, make it through both capacitor plates. And... Um, we want it to accelerate 
So let's say that uh, this is zero. We create an electric field in this direction. So our electric fields go from high to low potential. So we have, uh, we'll set this plate of the capacitor to zero, the other one to V. And so we're going to accelerate these particles uh, between the plates of the capacitor. And let's say we accelerate them to a very high speed. So, uh, so high that we can disregard the initial motion of the, uh, the particles. Because they do come with a distribution of speeds. But let's just ignore that. Let's say that the initial velocity is essentially zero. Because if they're going fast enough at the end, that would be the case. All right, uh, or approximately. So now we have to be a little careful here because we're using V for potential. So that's a capital V. We're also going to talk about velocity. So we're going to accelerate these particles through a potential difference V. And then they're going to enter this magnetic field region that's going to cause it to go on this circular arc. And what we're going to do is let's build a detector somewhere. And so let's analyze both parts of this motion. And we put the entire thing in a vacuum chamber so we can ignore air resistance. So let's say that they enter the capacitor with essentially no velocity at point A. And then they accelerate to point B, after which they leave the capacitor and enter the region with the magnetic field. And because we're in a vacuum, we can say energy at A equals energy at B. And we're ignoring the initial kinetic energy because it's relatively small. And so the potential energy here is going to be E times, let's just call it E times V. Uh, because we set the zero to be, uh, the negative plate to zero, then uh, the potential energy is just going to be Q times V. They're singly ionized particle, so we have E times V. Now at B, the potential energy is zero, so we have kinetic energy. Uh, 1 half m v b squared. And that's it. There's no potential there. And so in a sense, we know how fast the particles are moving when they enter this region with a magnetic field. And now let's look at that. We're going to apply F equals m f. Now the force is going to be E v b. where this V is velocity, not potential. So again, in general, force is QVV sine of theta. But the charge is E. It's a singly ionized molecule or atom. Uh, let's say atom. So it's, uh, the charge is E. And the velocity in the magnetic field, like this path is in the XY plane, and the magnetic field is always in the Z direction. So the angle between velocity and magnetic field, in this case, is always going to be 90 degrees. So that's the force. And then equals m v squared over r. You know, force is mass times acceleration. Uh, the acceleration is v squared over r. And again, they enter this region with a velocity VB, and that is constant throughout the entire path. Okay, and now we want to put this together. So let's clean up this equation a little bit. Let's multiply by R divided by VB. So again, we can cross off one of these VBs and move the R to the other side. And uh, that's it there. So um, basically, we have these two equations to work with. Now, um, here we have a VB squared. Here we just have VB. So let's do one more thing. Let's square this equation. 
Hey, let's actually do this. So we're taking this equation and squaring it, and now let's just write down this equation. We're going to multiply this equation by 2. And we want to work with these two equations now. So um, let's, uh, let's multiply this. This is the set we're working with now. It's basically just this equation and this equation. Uh, this one we just multiplied by 2 to get rid of the fraction. Uh, this one we squared it. And now let's multiply a second equation by m. So we have 2mev, where that v is a potential. Uh, that's equal to m squared vb squared, which is equal to e squared b squared r squared. And let's actually solve for the mass. We cross off one of the e's, and I'm going to write this in a particular way. So let's put a box around this. Let me just double check. Yeah, e b squared r squared divided by 2v. There we go. Okay, so I wrote it in this particular way because say we actually set this up physically. And we put a detector a certain distance from where the particles enter this region with a magnetic field. So uh, d is fixed in this experiment. And let's say we also fix V. So the potential difference uh, is fixed. And in a sense, R is fixed because, you know, we want to look at the particles that can loop around and enter the detector. And E is fixed because they're singly ionized particles. And uh, so this is just some constant. For this particular experiment that we set up, this is constant. And what we do is vary the magnetic field. And so picture of the magnetic field is very small. What's going to happen? What are we going to see at the detector? Nothing. If the magnetic field is small, the particles are going to mostly just go straight. Magnetic force is what's deflecting them. That's going to be small. Not much is going to happen there. And as we increase the magnetic field, this radius is going to decrease. So say we keep increasing it, the radius keeps decreasing, eventually we'll have them looping around, but, uh, you know, they're still missing the detector, but if we increase the magnetic field, the radius is getting smaller, these particles are going to keep moving, and eventually we're going to hit the detector. And, uh, yeah, we can find, like, the mass of the particle that hits that detector. Because R in this case, like when it actually hits the detector, we know what R is. That would be something we physically set up. It's half the distance from where they enter to the location of this detector. So R is known, V we set up, E is known. And so we could keep adjusting the magnetic field until we detect particles in the detector and we know what magnetic field, so we're varying the magnetic field, and we just keep increasing it until something happens in the detector, and we say, okay, that happened at this magnetic field, we can determine the mass of these particles. So this device is called a mass spectrometer. Uh, it can be used to detect the masses of charged particles. So that by itself is very important. Uh, what's interesting is if you do this experiment, let's say we keep varying the magnetic field. And let's call S the signal we get at the detector. So typically that's going to be zero unless we have just the right magnetic field to cause the particles to hit the detector. And so we might expect a graph that looks like this. It's zero, then at some point we'll get the particles hitting the detector. And then if the magnetic field is too strong, the radius is so small they don't even reach the detector anymore. 
And so we might expect something like this doing the experiment, but uh, what we'll actually get is something more like this. Depends on what type of gas we're dealing with here, but we'll get like multiple signals from the detector at different magnetic fields, which is interesting because we're dealing with a particular gas. Like say this is neon. So we have a neon gas, and uh, you, know, you think there's atoms inside. These atoms all have the same mass, so they should all hit the detector at the same, for the same magnetic field, but they don't. And the reason why is because there are different isotopes of neon. So like neon is, I think that's 18 on the periodic table. Let's see. Um, or is it 10 on the period? Let me just look that up. Should know this for some reason. Blanking on that. Um, yeah, neon is 10 on the uh, periodic table. And the atomic mass is 20.18. Which, uh, Now again, the atomic mass is basically the number of protons and neutrons in the atom. And so you'd kind of expect maybe integer values for atomic mass, but that's not what happens most of the time. And the reason why is a typical neon atom will probably have 10 protons and 10 neutrons. That's most likely the case. So that would be an atomic mass of 20, However, there are some isotopes. Some of the atoms are going to have an extra neutron. So maybe we'll have 10 protons and 11 neutrons. And then we could have 10 protons and 12 neutrons. And so uh, some of the molecules have different masses, and so uh, they'll end up at different places. And the more massive the particle is, the more inertia it has. So again, you want to change its motion so it's completely going the other direction. The more massive the particle is, the more difficult it is to do that. And so you would need a stronger magnetic field for a heavier particle. So like the first one you get would be the lightest atoms. And then you keep increasing the magnetic field. And Or let's look at it a different way. Let's say we have a, a particular magnetic field. We might get something like this. You know, if you can actually see this path, which sometimes you can actually see the path. We'll talk about that later. But, uh, yeah, these would be the weak, the lightest isotopes. And then, you know, the next heavier ones with that extra neutron, they have more mass, so they're harder to turn around. So they're going to end up over here. And then the more massive ones will end up over here. And so then if you increase the magnetic field, the whole pattern shifts to the left. So uh, this one's going to go to zero, and then we'll get the next one. And so using a mass spectrometer, you can not only determine you know, the masses of these particles, but you can also determine you know, like what types of isotopes, and also the fraction of the isotopes. Like most of them are just 10 protons, 10 neutrons, so we'll get a very strong signal here. Uh, there's a lot more particles in this beam than in the other two. So we get a stronger signal, more charged particles entering the detector uh, at this magnetic field. Now when you get to this isotope, uh, there's not nearly as many, and so we'll get a much smaller signal. So we can not only determine how many isotopes there are, you know, the masses of them, but also, like for a given sample, what percentage of the atoms are isotopes, like what percentage have an atomic mass of 21? You know, these would have an atomic mass of 20. 
say 21, these are 22, and uh, yeah, just by the relative size of the signal, we can determine uh, what percentage each of these make up. So a very important device, this mass spectrometer. Now, uh, there's a few other examples I want to talk about with uh, yeah, motion of charged particles. We'll do that in separate videos.